Hi, uh, welcome back to Studio Soapbox. This is video number three. Um, I'm Chris, and today I am going to be showing you the process by which I color um, a piece of artwork. In this case, the lobby card from the Krogan Adventures radio show that I started last time. Um, this is going to be a mix of digital and watercolor uh, technique. Uh, it's a the watercolor part is something that I learned from a buddy of mine, Joe Flood, uh, known for his work on the Orcs Forged for War uh, graphic novel and his uh, upcoming art on uh, the Cute Girl Network, uh, written by Greg Means and M. K. Reed. Uh, he came by, did a a demo to one of my classes where he showed how he how he used this, and I really dug it, and so I started uh, playing with it myself and. Um, while I'm not necessarily sure if I'm going to be employing it in pages, uh, I am definitely using it in some of this promotional art. So uh, this will give you a chance to see how that's done. Okay, now I have a two-monitor setup, which makes doing a screen capture uh, pretty much impossible um, because I do go back and forth from one to another. So I figured the best way to do this would be a slightly clunky... Um, uh, handheld approach, uh, so apologies if it's just a teeny bit shaky, uh, but I figured that once I get to the actual coloring, I can set this up on a box and then it won't be as shaky. Um, so I've scanned in the uh, original art. You can see that there's still um, some blue line visible in here. Uh, I scanned it at about 600 dpi, so this is the original here. Um, uh, see it in my hand. It's, uh, on a piece of 11 by 17 paper. Um, and what I'm going to do is show you my technique for preparing for color. It's uh, different from most other people's that I know, so I thought it might be worth, uh, worth showcasing here. Um, the action bar over here uh, is one that I use a lot for this particular part of the process. I've got this all set to where I can just click a button, but I'm going to go through it manually just to show you how it's done. Okay, so if I can find where my mouse is, there we go. Um, okay, so the first thing that I do is go up to Image, Adjustments, and Levels. Um, and I'll just put it over here. Um, and what I do is I'll drag this. This basically makes it to where the black becomes really black, the white becomes really white. I won't even touch the white. Um, I was working with digital pencils. Um, if you're working with coal erase um, or another blue actual physical pencil, then you may need to tweak the white a little bit because it can get kind of dark. But this is all fairly uniform. It was printed out um, in uh, a fairly light cyan. And so I'm not worried about that. So I move this middle section, or I move the black, into the middle. I go until just after it started to plateau, and that makes the line art look fairly thick here, but once I delete everything else, it's not going to look like that. It's going to be as close to my original as my intention was. Um, so I'll click OK on that, and then that's all locked into place. The next thing that I do, whoops, uh, here we go, is make sure that my color is set to black, um, which it is, but I'll just drag it down there, click OK. Um, I will go up to select color range. What this does, no, sorry, drag this over atop the rest. Um, what this does is it makes it to where I'm selecting anything that's black. Um, so I hit that. And it has to be the color that your palette is set on. Now, the difficulty with this is it's also selecting just a little bit a lot of the darker grays, speckles that might have ended up on the paper, imperfections in the scan, that sort of thing. So while it's selecting all the black, which is nice, that's not exactly what I want. Um, also, bear in mind, this doesn't really work for dry brush. This works really well if you have flat blacks and whites the way that, the way that I do. Um, I'm sure there are variations you could utilize with dry brush, but I have not found them for, I haven't really had use for them. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go up to Select Inverse. I'm going to click that. And then, rather than selecting all of the black, it is selecting everything that is not black, which is actually what I want, because now all I'm going to do, 
is hit delete and there we go um everything that is not black is now gone it is pure black and white well not pure black and white we'll get to that in just a second now I hit delete there but uh, I'm using Photoshop CS3 uh, if you're using possibly four definitely five or six uh, then you're gonna have a little bit of a problem there uh, what'll happen is it won't immediately delete uh, what it'll do is it will bring up a little window that says something to the degree of fill something I can't remember off the top of my head um, but what you would want to select is background color provided that your background color is usually left white um, what this will do is it'll delete it off this base background layer um, if you're on a separate layer not an issue but if you're using your background like I do I try to keep as few layers as possible uh, while I'm working um, uh, it will demand that so you know don't pick content aware don't pick whatever else just pick background color and that will take care of that all right now this is black but it's still Photoshop be black so um, I don't have both of my hands to use my quick keys which is slowing me down significantly if you look at this you can see that the the edges which are ostensibly hard aren't in fact not hard at all they're very fuzzy there are grays in there there are light gradations um, you can see that it moves from black to a medium gray to an extremely light gray and what this means is that if I were to employ the paint bucket um, which I am want to do then um, this is what's going to happen it's going to leave a fuzzy white line around absolutely everything that I try to paint um, if you have tried using paint buckets in the past with the brush tool, uh, then you've found this to be true. Um, so what I do to avoid that is I go up and there's another bunch of processes. I go up and I click image mode. Oh, uh, you've got to go to grayscale first. I'm going to move to, to bitmap. Um, but you move to grayscale first and as you can see, Nothing has happened. It's all still fuzzy. Um, but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change it to image mode bitmap. And what bitmap does, if you choose the 50% uh, the threshold uh, thing, it basically means that anything that is lighter than 50% gray is immediately changed to white. Anything darker than 50% gray is immediately changed to black. Um, and so what you get is a pure black and white, everything being one or the other. So I'm going to click OK on that and watch what happens to these hard edges. They become very hard edges um, to the point that now were I to want to use a paint bucket, it's going to butt up immediately to all those hard rastered edges. Um, so I'm going to pull out a little bit and show you what this looks like it still looks fine it's uh, people have a tendency to not like the uh, the bitmap or hard rastered edges digitally because they do look clunky if you're at anything other than 12.5 percent 25 percent 50 percent or 100 percent um and because let me zoom in one you can see what I mean see now all of a sudden there's this gross raster um, whereas if you zoom out no gross raster everything's pretty smooth um, but anyway so now this is bitmap but bitmap doesn't do me any good because I can't use a paint bucket it has to remain pure black and white so I'm gonna go back up to image mode grayscale click OK and image mode RGB. I've taken to coloring an RGB just because I don't even care. Um, when I change, when I prepare files for print, I'll go in and change it to CMYK. Um, I'll make adjustments as necessary if I have a particularly bright color that's no longer resonating. Um, I'll make sure that my, my blacks are conditioned to print uh, expectations. Um, but I found that it's a lot easier for me to color in RGB, so therefore I'm just going to go ahead and do it. Um, 
Uh, this goes entirely contrary to everything that I learned uh, as a graphic design major, um, but I found that it works a whole lot better for me. So I'm I'm more than willing to uh, to to uh, throw away traditional logic for what makes things work in my favor. Um, okay, so now I'm RGB, but the problem is I still, if you look at the layers, this is still a background layer. Um, and I don't have all that much option, uh, so far as what I can do, because I like to color underneath, I like to do line trapping. Um, so what I'm going to do in this case, I'm going to go up to select again, and color range. I haven't changed my color from black, oh wait, no, I totally have. I changed it to pink to do that, uh, to do that little paint bucket demo. So I'm going to pick black again. You can actually, there's a quick key to change to black, which is just you hit the letter D and it will automatically change to black. Um, then I go up to select again, color range, allow it to be on 200. If I can find my mouse, I'm looking through the, uh, through the camera screen, so it's sometimes tough to see. Click OK. And now everything is selected again. Um, what good does this do me? It does me good when I click edit, copy, and then I select all. I select my entire canvas, delete it, and now there's nothing there. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to paste that image. So now I've got that same image in there, but if I turn off the background, you can see that now that image is just that black line art. Um, so turning off my background layer, you can see that's just the black line art. I can now create layers behind the line art to color where they're not going to go over it. And I can do color traps on the line art without ever having to use that clunky magic wand tool. Um, I don't mind the magic wand tool for selecting, but I hate using it with color. There is nothing less intuitive uh, in my mind than having to color sections of something where there's a zippy dotted line flashing around it. Um, I can't, uh, you know, eh, it just doesn't feel like working on paper. I like to feel like I'm working on paper even when I'm working digitally. It's paper with a with a undo button. Um, so now my file is all set to go. I'm just going to make a new layer behind it, and time to get coloring. Got to apologize for the glare. Um, I've got fluorescent lights over it. I have a little uh, piece of board that comes over to try and diminish it somewhat, but it's it's not great. Um, uh, I used to have this light uh, taken out uh, for a long time just so that over my computer didn't have a glare but we're in the process of having our house on the market and I want to ensure that you know it looks like all the lights work so um, okay so I've got a fairly limited palette here um, it's not that limited it used to be three lines then it was six lines um, the, the bottom two are just purely for doing adventure time stuff um, but everything from about three and a half lines up is is mostly for Krogan stuff, ending with this like bright peach. Um, but uh, I'll I'll have a pretty good idea in my head as to which of these colors apply for which person. Um, some of them are very specific, so like this, uh, each color has uh, usually a care. I have uh, maybe about. 10 different skin types for 10 different characters, um, and they tend to be employed for most of them. Um, depending on a character's ethnicity, job, um, <laughs> excuse me, um, I'll make adjustments, um, to existing palette issues. What in the world? Oh, wrong, wrong, uh, wrong color. There we go. Okay. Um, Ah, here we are. Okay, so I am going to fill in the areas that have uh, the lines broken. So, like right there and right there, the uh, the the line is not entirely visible. Um, and at this point, unless I'm much mistaken, I can just 
do a quick paint bucket. I am much mistaken, and my paint bucket is set at 55. No wonder this isn't working. Okay. Is that uncontiguous? Okay. So that means I'm missing a line here somewhere. Ah, and I see where it is. Okay. So if you look here, there's a teeny, teeny spot in which that paint can spill out. So I'm going to fill that in, and then bam, now... It works, and I have just the neck. Well, the neck and the earring, but I can fix that shortly. Um, now, that's the only skin that this guy's got. Um, this guy doesn't show any skin in the background characters. I'm thinking about doing watercolors. So, I'm now done with this uh, skin point at this point. Now, with each of these colors, I have a, um, a cell shade color that fits, and that's where I'll throw in my, uh, I'll throw in my shadows, um, to give the, uh, the image a little bit more depth. And for the paint bucket, I have the, I have it set on, uh, tolerance of two, and contiguous, and all layers is very important. If you don't have all layers checked, then when I hit paint bucket here, it'll fill up the whole thing. So now it'll register the black line, um, and that'll make things a little bit easier for me. So, there we go. I'm happy enough with that. Um, I'll throw just a little bit more up here, because he's got on a hat. Maybe that'll throw some shading on there. Um, because his hair is, in theory, black, I'm not going to use a brown here. I'll use a very dark gray um, to throw in the details there. Same with that hat, same with this glove. And I try to hit most of the colors. If I know that something's going to be the same color used many times, I'll save myself the effort of having to select it more than once um, by going in and trying to hit it everywhere I can. So if I'm doing the belt, Sometimes the characters will have black leather, sometimes they will have brown leather. Um, in the case of Catfoot, he's, he's got black. Um, and basically, the way that I handle that is, I'll just, you know, the majority of it will be black, and then what I put in as the highlight will either be brown or gray. Gray inferring black, brown inferring brown. Go, got a leg up there. And this guy also, his outfit is black, and so I'll do the same thing. Now with him, I really want to make sure that, or with any of the characters, if I have the opportunity to use the same color multiple times, I'll do so. Um, I want to keep the palette as unified as possible. The fewer colors that I'm able to use in a given composition... Uh, the more likely that composition is going to look as though it were very intentional, as though it were put together, as the, if I knew where, what I was doing. Um, this guy's whole bit of business is black. Like socks and everything. Whoops. Should have checked to see that that toe fills in. It doesn't. There we go. That's a buckle, so I won't have that. Um, and the rest of them, I believe, is going to be whites and creams. So, at this point, is all of Krogan that would be black, black? It seems to be. Um, so, I'm set to go on to the next color. I am going to save uh, this image because it would be foolish to not do so. Okay, um, all right, so, and you know what, although he wears a lot of gold earlier, I wonder if I should push him towards silver. Nope, he's gonna, he's gonna have gold. Um, so his earring will be gold, the coins on his necklaces are gold, the buttons are gold. That's actually a coat button. I did not realize. 
his uh, belt buckle. His belt buckle has little decorative studs in it, apparently. Um, I say apparently as if I didn't draw it. I drew it. I knew it had decorative studs. Um, a little bit more up there, a little bit more up there, and I believe that that is the extent of the gold that I need. Um, with Montero, though, would these be gold or silver? These would be silver, so I'll leave these for later. Ah, his sword hilt, though, should be gold because I had a toy sword like this when I was a kid. I had a silver handle gold thing, and that's the default that swings to my head. Um, so now I'll go in and add the uh, the details. I'm going to click this little button right here. Um, let me pull this in real close. Whoops. I'm sorry. Uh-oh. Oh, I'm holding the, uh, the lens there. There we go. Um, so this button right here is the lock button. Unlocked, locked. Basically what this means is that I can... Oops, let me... This. I cannot draw anywhere that there's not already line, but I can draw anywhere that there is. Um, so that can be a really helpful little tool. Dun, dun, dun!